Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today I am talking to the great Ginger Wildheart. If you don't know who Ginger Wildheart is, you probably live in North America. Over in his native England, the singer-songwriter and guitarist is deservedly famous, respected, and beloved as the founder and frontman of his hard-hitting namesake combo, The Wild Hearts. On this side of the pond, well, let's just say folks have a lot of catching up to do. And I do mean a lot. The on-again, off-again Wild Hearts are just one segment of this prolific and eclectic artist's long resume, which also includes more than a dozen solo albums in a variety of genres, stints with everyone from the Choir Boys to Michael Monroe, and a handful of great side projects. Here's the latest one, Ginger Wildheart and the Sinners, an American-centric roots rock outfit whose members went out for drinks before they ever played a note of music together. Based on the quality of their new self-titled debut, his first North American release in years, it was definitely a winning strategy. A few weeks before the album arrived, Ginger zoomed in from home to talk about his new music, some of his own favorite bands, gore movies, pickled eggs, and a whole lot more. Enjoy. Ginger Wildheart, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's great to meet you. And you, how are you? I, I am just fine, sir. You're doing well today? Yeah, great. It's a heat wave over there. Where, where, what's it like where you are? Oh, I'm in the middle of Canada and it is uh, it is raining. So we've got your weather and you've got ours. Oh, yes. I love it. I've just got into um, uh, Great Lake Swimmers. Who, oh, uh, fantastic band. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe I never heard them before. They're now officially my favorite Canadian band. Oh, well, I'll pass that on to their publicist and uh, he'll be thrilled. <laughs> oh, great. And they're one of them bands that, like all the best bands, they've got loads of records. So when you get into them, You've got a lot to go and discover. I love it. Well, talking about a guy who's got loads of records, you've got yeah, loads of yeah, records yeah. too. And, and 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 the one we're here to talk about today is, is Ginger Wildheart and the Sinners. And I got to tell you, I am particularly happy to be talking to you about this one. I've wanted to talk to you for years because I've been listening to your music for about 20 years and saw you way back when you guys played at South by Southwest in like, I don't know, 2004 or something. But, yeah. but this, this new album to me is, is one of the, the best things you've done, like top five in, in the whole catalog. So, you know, between that and the, the recent Wild Hearts comeback albums, Renaissance Man and 21st Century Love Songs, you're on a real roll here lately. You've got a lot of momentum going. What's going on? Or is this just dumb luck? Or are you doing something differently or what? No, I think it's just I've been doing this a long, long time. I'm kind of I got pretty good at it. Um, a bit like if you build guitars for a long time, your guitars shouldn't get worse. You know, um, it's uh, something that I don't I've, I don't get writer's block. I've I'm always been inspired by something. So as long as I'm being inspired, then the tunes are always there. Um, the Sinners thing was it was a lot easier to do than than a lot of records because we literally recorded it pretty much live and we hadn't met before we met at the studio to go and record. So it was like in for a penny and it just worked out so well. I mean, we had, we had the the first meeting in the pub to make sure that no one turned into an idiot with a few beers. Um, and then we went back to the studio and, and the magic happened. And it was really that organic. It was a, It's the most organic, least amount of effort band I've ever, ever been in. Um, and it it sounds just, I'm, I'm a big fan of music that sounds like that. So I, I kind of, I would know if we'd done a bad job. <laughs> but it's, it's, all of our favorite bands are all represented in our sound. So we kind of, we're all a fan of that kind of music. Well, for people who, who haven't heard it yet, what, what bands are you talking about there? Well, I imagine if you crossed um, the Almond Brothers with Jason, with G Georgia Satellites and the band and Status Quo and a bit of Credence, um, Crosby, Stills and Nash, uh, Jayhawks, Wilco, I mean, all of that, that kind of stuff that we all kind of love. Yeah. It's a it's a hodgepodge of all of that sort of stuff. But the the one thing I'm I'm missing in music these days is melody and harmony. And so you know we're really into um, choruses, big catchy choruses, three part harmonies. So, so it's very much like I've got that 
kind of Crosby, Stills and Nash kind of sound to it as well as as well as well as like kind of the Eagles, I guess, is a is a pretty good one as well. So, yeah, it's it's just the music that we all like, and it it comes out as naturally as water coming out of a waterfall. Did, did you write all these songs yourself, or was there more sort of collaboration in this? Uh, both. Uh, it was it was refreshingly um collaborative because i'm not used to writing with people so we just turned up and the the best thing was the my first impression was they're not very precious if someone's got a part and it doesn't fit no big deal let's move on um which sometimes can be a little bit of a, a bone of contention when you're trying to write with someone um and the fact that we all kind of like the same sort of music was it was easy so i had a couple of songs going in there um and then we wrote a few songs together uh, and it's it was just again just that word organic. It's very very uh, easy. That 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 story about you guys meeting up first and then going to the bar. I mean, how did you pick and choose who you were going to meet up with in the first place? Well, the, they were a band already called Stone Mountain Sinners, right? And I wanted to do a, a, a more rootsy kind of country based uh, album, rock album. Um, and I wanted to just take a band, um, you know, I, I imagine myself a bit like Bob Dylan taking the band, obviously not, but, um, you know, that, that thing, just taking a wholesale bunch of people and just say, hello, <laughs> and I'm the only one that you don't know. Um, and uh, and it, it, it was great. They just turned up and they all knew each other, obviously. Um, and that was part of the, that was one of the hard bits was that there was only me that really had to fit in. Uh -huh. So it was it was easy, you know. It's a, they're really really good guys, really good supportive kind of guys that have got your back. Um, well, that's and, a trick, isn't it? Too. I mean, uh, as you've learned over the years from being in a band, I remember I was talking to uh, somebody once, and they said to me, "It's you know, you can find a whole bunch of guys that you can spend all day in the in the in the studio with, or you can play on stage with, but it's hard to find guys that you can spend a day in a van with." And that's what you do for most of the day. You're on stage for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. The rest of the day, it's got to be fun. And you've got to have people that understand that, it, you know, you, you try your best to be positive. You can't be positive all the time. Right. But these are guys that understand the effects of positivity and negativity uh, on everyone. Uh, and they're, they're very much team players, uh, which, is, again, is very refreshing uh, to have a whole band like that. So there's no one complaining. Oh, mm -hmm. It's it, it feels like home. So you hadn't met them at all before. I mean, you had just like heard their music and decided these are the guys for me and, and fired off an email kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I listened to the CD. They haven't even got a picture of themselves on the CD. So I didn't know which one was which. So <laughs> Neil, the vocalist, you know, the head honcho walks in. I'm like, OK, which one are you? <laughs> He's like, I've never been asked that before. I'm Neil, the guitar, the songwriter, singer, guitar player. I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> that could have been a bad int introduction. But um, again, we went to the pub and we found a mutual love for ale and pickled eggs. Okay, <laughs> you probably don't know where I'm going with that one. Pickled eggs. Do you do you have pickled eggs? Oh yeah, we have we have pickled eggs. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> they're they're very much ale and pickled egg guys, and uh, yeah, and yeah, too. When you find a fellow pickled egg guy, well, it's it's you, you, you cling go. on to them. You handcuff yourself to that guy. Yeah. You do. <laughs> so uh, you know, I find it interesting that for for a guy growing up in the north of England like you did, that so many of your influences are are th these rootsy American guys. Where did that Where did that come from? Was that something you picked up uh, from your parents, or was there that that kind of a a scene in in, in where you grew up, or what? Um, it was um, when I was a kid, uh, there was a lot of country on the radio. There wasn't a lot of music. So they were just putting everything on the radio. And, and you know, you, you got a lot of rubbish country. Um, but then you got, you know, George Jones was still getting played. Jim Reeves, um, you know, Dolly Parton was was a big thing. I was a big Dolly Parton fan uh, mm -hmm. before punk and before you know all these these other things that went on to influence me. So I was a I was a fan of of the country style writing, the harmonies, uh, you know, the storytelling, the fact that it's, you know, working class music, it's it's all blues, isn't it? Um, and, and from where I come from, folk music 
uh, plays a big part as well. Barnsley, Lindisfarne, Richard Thompson. Uh, again, using the same ingredients and just putting a different, slightly different accent on it. But it's the same stories of like, you know, toil and trouble and, uh, you know, heartache and, and you know, finding sunshine at the end of it. Uh, that's... They're, they're the they're the big subjects to anyone who's not living in a fantasy world. It's like real stuff, real real life stories. Uh, so before punk, which really took me, it was all about just finding good good songs with good melodies and good harmonies, and that's all from country. So I was I was into this sort of music before um, before I was into punk or into rock or into anything like that. And then a bit later, after punk died off. And there was bands like Discharge um, and Exploited, uh, GBH, a few good bands. But um, the most exciting stuff was going on over America. Uh, Long Riders and Jason the Scorchers and yeah. Lone Justice. And then a bit later, Uncle Tupelo and, and it became Wilco and Jayhawks and all that stuff. And I've always kind of gravitated towards that style of writing. Yeah. Um so I just I just found it again, and then kind of recently I realised that I, I better go and find out where this stuff come from. And so I'm not, I then became obsessed with early seventies music, you know, from like Little Feet and and Steely Dan, things I, I wasn't really that familiar with. Um, and and now I'm just a bit of a, a vinyl obsessive, and it's all uh, America's fault. <laughs> well, I, I personally, I look forward to your Little Feet uh, Steely Dan influenced album. When's that one coming up? <laughs> oh, well, there's a, I've got a few. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple out already. One called Ghost in the Tanglewood. And right, one yeah. Called, uh, Pessimist Companion. That's a bit more yeah. of that kind of acoustic forky kind of style. This one's a bit more bombastic. This one's a bit more status quo, Jason, uh, status quo, Georgia Satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, plenty of the band and 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 you know, harmony stuff like Creedence and uh, Crosby Stills and Nash. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, it's in my DNA. Oh, exactly. I mean, and you you have been sneaking these things in for a long, long time now. I mean, I was listening, geez, just a couple of weeks ago to an ancient Jason Ringenberg album, solo album, and it's like all of a sudden, no, oh, there's your name in the credits. You know, yeah. so you've been kind of. Uh, putting one in here, here and there when you can for a long, long time. Yeah, and well, I, I, I was lucky enough to write the last Jason the Scorchers album with, with Dan right. Baird. Um, and I went to Nashville to do that with them all. And, um, and that was again, just, you know, funny little bits of, bits of fortune in, in these strange kind of, from strange directions. And you were like, yeah, whatever, I'm, I'm in. And there was a tour that I did um, when Jason uh, couldn't make it, so the, so we did a Ginger and the Scorchers tour, and I and J with Jason's full agreement, I sang for Jason and the Scorchers, which is terrifying when I think about it. I never do it now, but um, again, just you know, very much a kindred spirits in, mm. in as much as we don't play music, we are music. You know, right. every fiber of our person it resonates with music with with the creation of it, the listening of it, the, the adoration of it, the medical properties of it. It's, it, you know, we're all absolutely addicted to it. And that's, that transcends genres. So I think I, I, I appreciate those guys because they really are musicians, they're players, they're good guitar players and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You can't pretend to do that. No, no. Well, and for a guy who's so uh, enamored uh, of American music, it must be nice that this one is, is you know, coming out over here because a lot of your albums, people have to really sort of seek them out and find them, uh, you know, in this part of the world. Jesus, yeah. You want to try and find some Great Lake Swimmers albums in England. <laughs> There's one, you know, I found one. And I got it. I got it. I was like, oh my God, I found one. And I got it and it's on its way to me. And I went to a record shop the other day and they had one album and it was the one that I found. <laughs> Great Lake Swimmers are hard to find. So yeah, I, I understand about the, um, you know, the taxes and postal costs. Right. It's, it's the- Yeah, it's just the divide, you know, the cultural divide. Cause I mean, I've been, I've been writing for years that, you know, I mean, I, I firmly believe it's one of music's great injustices that, that you aren't a household name in America and you aren't, you know, playing arenas here on a constant basis. It's like, you know. You know what, a lot of my favorite musicians, and I, I, 
I, you know, I don't just say this, you know, to echo my fortunes, but um, mm. a lot of my favorite musicians, I had no idea how big they were. It was pre-internet. Um, and I, I, I'd go to see them live and they'd be playing a small place. And, you know, they they could have been labeled as underachievers compared to someone that was doing bigger. But as far as I was concerned, that, that stuff, like, just enveloped me. That... Mm -hmm. it, it was more, much more important the message and the and the the contact was more important than the success or the the sure. how, how well they're doing commercially and uh i never gave it a second thought and and you know for example fishbone didn't make it and red or chili peppers did you yeah, know exactly figure that one out maria mckee did, didn't make it and you know some well insert dodgy female singer of your choice. I mean, there's some amazing artists that didn't do as well as some other people, usually because they've got like standards, you know, and there's things that they won't do. There you go. I'm, I'm happy that I've made a living out of this and I feed my family and I still get to do it and I'm still excited, you know? Oh well, yeah, that, I mean, that's the best part after all these, after all these years, because this has got to be your, I don't know what, 35th, 40th album when you, when you tally them all up. You know, well, we've, we've got the Sinners album. And during lockdown, we went and recorded a second Sinners album, and I'm currently recording a solo album that I think is my best album yet. So it doesn't look like it's going to dry up anytime yet, and which is good. You know, I, I was always told things like by the experts, don't flood the market. Right. Flood the, flood the market. I buy more than one album every two years. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I love I love that it's hard to keep up with you. It's because it's like you know sometimes I'll I'll go a couple of months and I haven't sort of checked your your corner of the online world or whatever, and then it's like oh here are two more albums that I that I never heard before to to, to dig into. It's great. It's a it's a, it's it's like finding a new Great Lake Swimmers album for you, you know? Isn't it? I mean, imagine imagine getting into the Simpsons now, and imagine how much joy you'd have going like oh my god, there's years of Simpsons. I I get more excited when I when I fall in love with the band. Yeah. And then I find out that they've got tons of records and I've just got, I've got a mission. I've got to find out. I mean, it's easier now because you can get online or you can go on Discogs or Wikipedia. But back in the day, I used to get into bands like Good Rats. I don't know if you ever heard of the Good oh, Rats. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, you bet. Our state area. Yeah. Um, and I had no idea if they had more than one record. As far as I was concerned, I had their record. Then I found a second one. And mm -hmm. then a couple of months later, a third one. And there was no way of finding out how many they've got. Now it's easier. You can you can find out how many I've got. You can probably even listen to them before you buy them. So yeah. I've got a lot of records, but I don't think there's anyone in the world that likes them all. <laughs> I wouldn't trust that person. They're dodgy. But you're not you're not going for that anyway, right? Because I mean, if if you were doing that, it would have to be you'd have to be really charting a pretty narrow, predictable course. So what's the point of that? You know. No, and it's all about the legacy that you leave behind. You know, I want to leave a legacy of of interest in music. Who knows? Like in fifty years' time, you know, I might I might be a, a Vincent Van Gogh, and people might be celebrating this music. I can't believe it didn't do better when he was alive. <laughs> but how many times have you heard that one? Well, exactly. Well, cool. my kids will be looked after, and my grandkids. So as long as it's a healthy legacy, and the and the and it's creative, and the music's interest, and then. Yeah, it's it's a lot of different styles because I like a lot of different styles. Exactly. So 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 talking about songwriting then, um, you know, especially when you've got this thing where you know, well, I've got this album and I'm I'm uh, you know I'm working on a solo album and I've got this project. I mean, are you able to? Um, how how does it work? I mean, do you just like turn your focus from one to the other to the other, and you can like sort of sit down and write ten rootsy rock songs if you need to, and then write 10 punk songs if you need to, and then write 10 polkas if you need to, or, or or do you just like write a whole bunch of stuff and then figure out what goes where? Um, Yes, they're both. <laughs> um, I, I, I tend to use this thing and I fill up the voice memos with uh, with ideas. Um, So there's always a lot of stuff to dip into there. Um, but if I'm right, I tend to write to order. So if I'm doing an album and it's, uh, a wild arts album for example uh, mm -hmm. I, I kind of know what we do and I know what we don't do so it's so my head's in the game and uh, so writing it demoing it and recording it is a kind of 
you know, you've got to give an album that much time. And then, you know, after it's re you've recorded, then there's a manufacturing, then there's a promotion. It's it's just a load of waiting around to do nothing. I just make another record, you know, and then I can just stagger the releases and keep myself busy and keep myself on the road. Um, but as long as you, you know, give enough time to the conception, uh, the inception of the conception of the album, then, you know, once it goes into doing, you know, promotion, then, you know, you just, that's easy. You know, right. you can be recording one album and uh, and promoting the last one. And it doesn't, it doesn't really mess with your head. You know, your, your creative focus is still on the thing that you're trying to give birth to at that one time. Right. So, yeah, I can I can juggle a few things. Uh, I can uh, I can I can multitask. I'm in touch with my feminine side, so I'm good at multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you do you do you overwrite? I mean, for example, for this Sinners album, uh, did you write you know 50 songs and then and then winnow it down, or is this you know what you what you hear is what you did and what you get? No, we uh, pretty much like most part, especially with the Sinners, we went in with tons of ideas mm -hmm. um some of them got to the point where you know we'd recorded the whole song and then we're mm, i'm not feeling it you know mm -hmm. and then you just move on don't be too precious about it and and you end up with the songs that you all kind of get a, a good feeling about so it's not like you know when you hear bands going out oh, we wrote 50 songs and we went in the studio yes. i don't think they wrote 50 so they had 50 ideas maybe uh -huh. You know, 50 finished songs. No one goes into a studio of 50 finished songs unless you're making a quadruple album or something. Well, maybe I'm Robert sure Pollard does. <laughs> What's that? Maybe Robert Pollard from Guided by Voices does, but that's about it, maybe. Oh, God, yeah, but he records it all. He used to record everything himself, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Which is easy, because then you don't have to teach it to anyone. That's a really good a good uh, hustle, that is. I, I'm very jealous of him for that. But now he does big sounding records, so... Yeah. It's costing them money again now. But um, yeah, it's, it, you know, I think creative people need to be creative. It's when you stop being creative is when the trouble happens. Mm. If I have a few days off because people think I need rest. That's when my head goes funny. So how, think, how funny? <laughs> what happens? There's bad thoughts come in and bad intentions and things like that. Bad habits that uh, I don't do anymore. Just so, gotta, yeah, just got to keep busy. Got to keep busy. Got to keep swimming. You okay. know? Otherwise, I'll die. Uh huh. So, so what comes easier to you, music or lyrics? Mm. Um. I think they're both the same. Uh, again, it's just uh, slightly different shape hats, but both the same double sides of the of the same coin. Um, okay. So lyrics, I mean, you get you get an outpouring of lyrics, like you'll get an outpouring of chords or, or, or you know, right. the arrangement of a song, and then you'll fine tune it, and then it's a little bit harder because you're thinking more about how things are going to work when someone's heard it ten times. How we're going to still make this work without it sounding like you've just chucked it together. And the same with words, you'll just be there'll be a line or two that's just bugging you and you can't let those lines go. So I'll find that I'm writing in the studio while I'm singing. I'm like, oh, I've got a better one than that. So <laughs> it's a, again, they they never finish. They're both easy and they're both quite complex and they're both never finished. So you just got to walk away from it. That's, like they say, all, no, no art is ever finished. It's just merely abandoned. abandoned. So I think that's what you got to do with messing with lyrics. You can make writing as hard as you want it to be. Um, and I do try to make it hard. I do, I do try to, you know, if I if I write a lyric that's just throwaway and it goes on a record, it'll haunt me for the rest of my life. So it's worth give it. For me. Give, me, give me an example. Uh, there's a song called Sick of Drugs, and it had a great line called, how can you feel when your mind's made up like a Ferris wheel? And I always used to call them Ferris wheels. And the band had this big thing about, it's too American. A Ferris wheel's American. You know, when your mind's made up like a dodging car, it doesn't rhyme. So we changed the line, when your mind's made up like a Ferris wheel, to the committee approved, your mind's made up like a will of steel. Oh, that's a hard Ferris wheel. 
why, why did it? Why did why did I bow down to peer pressure when Ferris wheel is obviously a better line? Mm -hmm. And so I've never sang Will of Steel live in my life. I sing the Ferris wheel line, and I said, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's a there's a few like that where you just went oh to keep the peace. Uh, well, that's the problem with music by committee, isn't it? Isn't it? But apart from the sinners, for uh -huh. some reason, the sinners it seems to work. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I probably best not to overanalyze that, but it seems well, to work. Yeah, that's the thing. You don't want to pin down that butterfly, right? Yeah, exactly. 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 So talking about having all these sort of different creative focuses and moving from project to project to project, how do you or do you even decide what comes next? Or do you just kind of follow your nose? Uh, usually it's already in the barrel, you know, it's like, right, like so how does it get in the barrel? I mean, do you, do you kind of go, you know what, I've always wanted to, uh, you know, make a flamenco album or whatever. So I'll put that one in the queue for six albums from now, or, or is it just, you wake up one day and there's a song in your head and it's maybe a jazzy song. And the next thing you know, you're recording a jazzy album. It can go like that. Um, you can get a song in your head and it's just a, a standalone idea. And then if there's a second song that comes from it, it's maybe a single. And then the th there's a third song that comes along in the same style, you're pregnant again and you've got an album in you. And then it, the whole process starts. You're pregnant so you be again. <laughs> you I like that. <laughs> be careful not to get too pregnant. Uh -huh. but, uh, so basically, I find, I find that. Albums fall exactly when when I, when I need them, I, and it's a process. I don't try and overthink. So, so you have plans, but you're kind of willing to change them. It sounds is like what I'm hearing. Absolutely, plans are only there um, to uh, subject a change. Right. You know, I, I've I, I've got so used to it over the years that now I, a plan is just something to write on. So you got the papers full. But uh, you got to turn plot twist, you know. Any, any, at any point, you just got to spin and go. Okay, we're going that direction with this, and um, and I'm glad that a lot of people get freaked out by that. But I'm glad that I, I actually embrace that. You know, even conversations when someone butts in a conversation, and you, you know, some people will get that thing they wanted to say out, and some people will just go with the new conversation, which I think is the way you should go. Well, it works for Neil Young on, the, you know, I don't know, conversationally, but the creative process to me, what you're talking about sounds a lot like the, the Neil Young thing where it's like, you know, oh, I was doing this one day and then I, I woke up and I heard a loud guitar in my head and then, uh, you know, I'm off to make a rock and roll album with Crazy Horse again, you know, just that kind of thing. So do you have like a bunch of unreleased stuff like, uh, I mean, because of things where, OK, maybe you get halfway through something and something else takes you off in another direction? Do you have all these sorts of orphans uh littering your back catalog that that you know you'd like to resurrect sometime well we we do have little bits and pieces lying around and eventually you'll get enough to make an interest in compilation mm -hmm. we've just had an, a compilation album come out called love in uh, in the time of cholera right uh, which was uh, done um in lockdown um we we had all these ideas together that uh, unless you've got enough ideas i don't believe in you know, just milking things or having instrumental versions or remixes, but mm -hmm. brand new tracks. Um, and it's a double album. There was tons of them. So I, I love stuff like that. I love when bands put these little scrappy albums together. I wish Sparks would do that. I'm a mm -hmm. huge Sparks fan. And they're one of the reasons why I still write because Ron Mail still writes. And he's still they still do an album almost a year, every two years or something. Got, I just saw them on, on in the spring on their tour. Have you seen them lately? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime that I get a chance, I, yeah, they're great. I, I, I love them. And the albums are still amazing. They're yeah. not like, you know, well, he can't sing like he used to. He can. Yeah, yeah, he he, they're just as exciting and just as inventive and lyrically just so clever. So as long as Sparks are making records, I will still make records. I, I just wish someone would make a Sparks compilation of all the rarities that you can get that are all <laughs> on like seventh, eighth generation taped. You know, it just, it sounds like you're listening through a pillow. I'd love to have like a real well-mastered rarities Sparks album. So if they're listening, and I would think you would love to collaborate with Sparks at some point. Oh, God. Well, yeah, I would. But as they say, 
collaborations don't work. <laughs> they don't work. work collaborations. No. Yeah, I think I, I think Sparks are one of those people. They they they're good by themselves. I don't think anyone's going to bring or add anything to that. Well, I didn't mind that they did that album with Franz Ferdinand. I thought it was pretty tolerable. It's all right, but the best things were the bits that sounded like Sparks. Sure, of course. Well, yeah. So who who would be on your bucket list that you would love to collaborate with that you haven't? Uh, I. Oh, I was going to say no one because I used to want to do things like that, and now I don't. But huh. I would like to collaborate with Richard O'Brien, who uh, wrote the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I was going to say the Rocky Horror Picture Show guy. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Well, he did an, a, a a movie called um, The Return of Captain Invincible. Right. And the outroar song, I've actually done a cover version for my next album. I don't know how it managed to be, be a long story, but um, but it's just um, the best song I've ever heard. And he has this lovely 50s sensibility in his songs, but they're all rock and roll and, and kind of pop glam. Mm -hmm. So they've got this kind of almost, well, not sexually subversive anymore, but you know, <laughs> yeah. back, back in the day, it was a little bit challenging. Um, and I just love everything about that. I think it's 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 such a brave and and striking move that it doesn't really age. Uh, so I'd love to collaborate with him. Um, you know, I don't know. Steve Earle would be nice. I, I, I'd like to kind of. I think I just like to hang out with Steve Earle. Um, <laughs> but you know, I don't. I don't really get the urge to. To I, I used to want to collaborate with everyone when I was a kid, and and now I'm I'm happy just to make my own funny little little records. Well, fair enough. I think it's interesting you brought up Richard O'Brien. I mean, that seems like a good uh, opportunity to to talk a little bit about movies. I was uh, fascinated that I guess it was maybe a year ago now, maybe more, that you you did a little series of YouTube videos as a beginner's guide to gore movies. Oh yeah, uh, I thought those were very cool. And 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 I got to give you kudos for for Brain Dead and uh, Ichi the Killer and and well, any Romero is you got to pick one. I, people would argue, I think, with your choice, but you got to you got to have one in there. Um, oh, are you just pick Day of the Dead? Yeah. Are are, are you are you just is, are you like a just a huge gore fan and nothing else, or are you just a giant movie buff across the board, or, or what? No, I just love movies. I really, I mean, you know, arguably horror movies are my kind of main subject. If mm. I had to answer questions on the telly, it would be horror movies. But I just love great films. Uh, I, you know, as, mu as much as I love music, really. You know, mm -hmm. it's just always been part of the, you know, the comfort and nature of uh, of art and entertainment. I still, you know, don't get enough sleep because I watch movies all night and blah, blah, blah. You know, I, and... Very, very seldom get to meet real movie buffs. They've usually got like a kind of a, a style of film that they like, sure. and then they're not really interested in anything else. I'll anything. I'll watch anything. Documentaries, especially. I can watch a documentary about anyone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. anyone. I mean, what lately you want to recommend? Documentary wise, or anything, anything. What 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 have you been watching lately that was good? Oh. That's a terrible one because I've, I have no idea. I've got the worst memory in the world. What I hear you. I hear you. Well, are, there, are there been any good documentaries? I'm, I'm asking my oracle over here. No, I didn't. I didn't really. No, there hasn't been any great documentaries recently. But I mean, God. You've seen, you've seen the Sparks documentary, obviously. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that was, I waited all my life for that. And it was, and it was almost good enough. Almost good enough. <laughs> they just they just skipped over too many albums. Sure. Well, I, come on. That, that'd be a, that'd be a four hour documentary. If they yeah, did all. It, it's all. It's the greatest thing about Sparks is everybody's got different favorite albums. They sure. did the the when they the twenty first album I think was um, Exotic Creatures from the Deep. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it's called. Uh, and the, so the, that was the 21st album. So over 21 days, they did 21 oh, yeah. shows, yeah. 21 yeah. albums in England. I was away in New York writing with Jason the Scorchers at the time. So mm -hmm. I could I missed them all. And not that I would have changed it for the world. But mm -hmm. apparently the people that I know, it's just the audience was completely different every night. That album was someone's favorite. And I think you've got to look at music like without, you know, without being a critic. You know, it's, it might not be your thing, but it's someone else's favorite thing in the whole world. 
And I feel like that with music. Uh, uh, we the first Wild Arts album had a song on that I wasn't going to put on the album. I didn't want to put it on, and and I was talked into it, and that song went on to pull someone out of a coma. So at that point, I was just like, I'm I'm not going to be a critic. If I write it, it's going on there. <laughs> Someone's favorite song, maybe not mine, and, and that's the way it normally goes with my stuff. Uh, if it's a song that I don't really like, it's definitely the first, the firm favorite of everyone. And and you know just the same. Well, artists, artists are never the best judges of their own work, are they? No, terrible, terrible. We make absolutely awful critics, which is why I, you know, I think most artists just don't really have the stuff they don't like in their kind of radar. It's just focused on stuff that's that's uh, stimulating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't waste any time with stuff that I don't like because I, I don't understand why anyone would. Right. You know, it fascinates me when people say, I, I don't like it, therefore it's shit. And, it's, and I, that's one of those things I'll, I'll never get. But it, you don't like it. You don't like Marmite, but it's delicious to someone else. Exactly. And music, exactly that, isn't it? So, talking about movies and music again, it would, would seem to me that you'd be uh, the kind of guy who would be uh, up for making a lot of soundtracks. I'd love to. My friend Clint Manson does that he he, he was a, a Birmingham lad he played in a band called Pop Will Eat Itself oh, and then he moved out to California started getting a few film jobs and now he's the go-to guy mm. which is really good because he's amazing and every one of his every one of his scores is a real old-fashioned original score and there was that that time where people were just chucking in rock songs right. and that was a soundtrack like nah it's not a soundtrack <laughs> um and, and I love original scores. And, and I think people just think that I just, if it, uh, you know, I only write on electric guitar, but um, I would love to be given the chance to score a movie with a, with a, with a, um, an orchestra. That would be, that would be a dream. Any particular kind of movie or any particular director you would gravitate to, or you do anything? Well, I do it. I, I, I wouldn't mind the movie to be good. Oh, well, sure, <laughs> sure. I like horror movies, and as you know, if you like horror movies, there are way more terrible horror movies than there are good ones. True. So, you know, something that was kind of creatively worthless. Although, if it had loads and loads of blood and guts in it, then I probably would do it, even if the movie was terrible. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I would, I, horror would be good because I'd be really comfortable with, the, you know, the kind of discord and those, you know, the, the kind of... The, the notation that Hammer movies used to use, where they would ramp up this, the, the, the tension and these notes would just be fighting against each other, like, you know, mm -hmm. um, semitones fighting against each other, you know, creating tension. I'd, I'd love to find out how, I'd, I'd love to experiment with creating tension with a visual on the screen. I think I'd be very, pretty good at it, but, you know, it's one of those things that I make up my break when I'm 80 and it, I'll still be good at it when I'm 80, so. Yeah, exactly. Know. Better late than never. You know, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be alive forever, so no hurry. Oh, all right. And 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 somebody should make a documentary about you, shouldn't they? <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe one day. But hopefully when I'm gone. Um, yeah. Do you want it to wait that long? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, I haven't had a success story yet, so I haven't got an ending. So I'll have to wait until I have like a big a big hit or I find a cure for cancer, and then I'll agree to a documentary. All right. Uh, well, I mean, in the meantime, you could write a memoir at least. How about? I'm sure you've got stories yeah. to tell. I've got a book that was written about the songs, all the songs I'd written, and there's a story that goes through that. Um, we we deleted that book so it would be a collectible, but that was the first kind of twenty odd twenty albums or something. So I've done that many albums since. So I'm probably going to have to do a, a volume two of that. Of that, but um, as far as books are concerned, especially memoirs, aren't you supposed to be like at the end of your life when you when you write them? It's not much of a memoir if you're at the beginning, really. Yeah. And you're going to live forever, so we're screwed. Yeah. I'm in no hurry, you know. I'll just have to. I'll have to just think it, and it'll come out in the written word by the time I get around to doing it. It'll be great. Perfect. I, I, I look really forward to that day myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one day it's coming. Uh -huh. So, does anybody call you by your real name anymore? 
my real name is Ginger Wildheart. I've it's changed. I've had it changed by uh, deed poll, so it's it's oh. legally Ginger Wildheart. So I, I keep saying all these things, Ginger, real name David Walls. It's not. It's Ginger Wildheart is my real name. Well, your birth name then, let's say. A, my birth name is David Walls, but I, my mom calls me David when when I'm getting told off, but no one calls me David. <laughs> all right, sir. Well, listen. I've taken up enough of your time on this fine day. I think I want to thank you very much again for uh, for talking to me for uh, and for all the music. And thank uh, you very much. Yes, this has been great. It's been fun. All right, and I'll I'll let the Great Lake swimmers know that you're up for a collaboration. Absolutely, you talk about collab. That's a collaboration I would like to have. Yeah, you're I'd like to collaborate with them and Band of Horses on the same song. Well, we'll we'll make it happen. We'll put it out to the gods, and I'm sure it'll it'll come true. Gotta have a dream. All right, brother. Thanks a lot. See you down the road. See you later. Bye-bye.